Uh, all right. So I'm joined here by my friend, Dr. Alan Drummond. And uh, <laughs> we're going to be talking about uh, the Alpha Fold, right? Alpha Fold? Is that Alpha Fold. Called? Alpha Fold. So we were talking in the most recent or, or in the first episode of the podcast. You uh, were talking about how there is the protein folding problem, which is kind of like uh, like like the next problem that that science was very invested in, I suppose. Yep, still um, is, I will say. Right, we'll get there. Is. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, and that was kind of like I don't know. It felt almost like the the predecessor to um, to to genome mapping and and the likes. Like it was a very like or I don't know. Like in, in terms of just like uh, how large the endeavor is and how much there was to do, or was it more like? Yeah, yeah it's I don't know. right. Um, you know, it's it's certainly related. Uh, it is a different problem conceptually. So mm -hmm. the you know the, the genome problem was sort of how do we read out the sequences and then you have to go off and sequence everything in the world. Um, here it was trying to figure out the rules mm, uh, okay. by which the stuff that's read off of genes then folds up and does you know it folds up into a particular shape. I and see, then, so. as, you know, as, you, as you probably remember, there's this question of, okay, once it has a particular shape, that's related to what it does in the cell. It's related to its function because its shape dictates the kinds of things that it can bind and right. the kinds of, of reactions that it can carry out. So that's the, that's the function. You know, <laughs> you, first you predict the protein fold, but what you really want to do, really, really, is predict protein function and be able to manipulate that. And that is still you know, very much in the future. Very cool. Okay, so... So the genome thing was more mapping, where we already knew the rules. Here, we didn't know the rules, so it, they looked like, well, I, I don't want to say random, but I'm, I'm sure at some point they kind of looked random, right, to us? Back in the day, yes, right? So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't want to go too far back into history, <laughs> but there was this time, you know, in the, in the, the 1940s roundabout, when, when suddenly we realized that proteins, which had been sort of known, you know, to exist in the cell, and known to do things, but nobody knew what they were made of, really. They knew they were made of amino acids, but they didn't know this kind of very specific thing about them, which is that they were chains of amino acids, like linear chains of amino acids that could then fold up into a particular structure. Okay, so once we discovered that, and the first, you know, first major protein structure that was that was solved was hemoglobin, right? That's this thing that binds oxygen mm. in our blood. Cool. Okay, so so this was a, a this incredible achievement, and then people said, okay, well, th th like I said uh, uh, th the last time around, but I know everybody here is new. <laughs> okay, so, so there was the, I think it was the 1956 Nobel Prize, somewhere in there to Christian Anfinsen, who demonstrated that the protein sequence alone contained all the information necessary to cause the protein to spontaneously fold up into that shape. That is... It didn't need any stuff in the cell. It didn't need ex any extra helpers. No additional information was, was required. You just take that sequence of amino acids in a chain, you drop it into water, and boom, it will go back into that, into that shape that then carries out function. And so how do you figure out the rules by which the amino acids, which are just like a, it's like a necklace practically, right? Like, so how does that thing know how to curl up into exactly this very precise three-dimensional structure with helices and sheets and different domains and things like this that can actually perform chemistry. Like How do you do is, that? Where That's, is the information contained is the question then or kind it's, of? Or? It's not so much where is it contained because then it's known that it's in the chain. You can think of right, that right, chain yeah. as like the chain is like a computer program written mm -hmm. in a language that we can't read. Okay, cool. Right. So, so what are the rules, right? So the chain is the information in itself. That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. So you can imagine, you know, just to give you a, a, a flavor for how this might work, um, if you imagine that the, the chain of amino acids is chains of beads of different colors. Okay. Right? So, so they're, and let's say that they're like red and blue and, and white beads. Mm -hmm. So you might say, well, one rule seems to be, when I look at the folded structure of this thing, I notice that there's always a white touching another white bead. So that might be a rule, right? Like the white beads are attracted to one another or the red beads repel each other, mm -hmm. right? Or the blue beads are always on the outside of the protein, so they like water, mm -hmm. versus you know the other things are on the inside of the protein, so they like to be away from water, which is on the outside. Those are the types of rules that then you can uh, turn into a possible solution to the protein folding problem, right? So you write down all the rules, and then I give you a new sequence, right? And you run your rules on it, and then does it fold up or not, right? Do you get the right structure? 
for that. So, for so the had we already figured out some proteins yes. then? So, okay, cool. So, so a yes. bunch of them had been figured out. We figured, yes, and exactly. This is the you know to to give you a taste of what what this result really means, right? From from DeepMind, right? So so DeepMind, of course, is just Google's kind of AI general thing, and then they have Alpha whatever, right? Uh -huh. Which is confusingly for us computer science type folks. Alpha Star, I think, was the StarCraft playing yeah. thing, right? Yeah. And Star is what we use for wild cards, right? So, so Alpha is called call it Alpha Star, which is Alpha Go, right? Did the Go playing thing. Alpha Fold is protein folding. Um, and all of these fall into some sort of, you know, you want to, in, in StarCraft, you want to play against, uh, against Grandmasters. Um, in Go, you wanted to play against a Nine Don player. In Alpha Fold, you have to go up against, you know, so who are the best protein folders? Okay, so there's this, there's this contest that's held every other year called CASP, which is like, I think it's critical um, assessment of structure prediction mm -hmm. is what it stands for. And here's the idea. We're constantly out solving new protein structures. That is, we find a biological molecule, we harvest it, we figure out how to purify it. We take it to one of these, you know, huge beam lines or do uh, uh, cryo-electron microscopy on it. We figure out, we use basically typical tools to figure out what that structure is. Which has nothing to do with the rules. Just has to figure out, you know, we we can shine light on in it, on it in exactly the right way and watch the diffraction and figure out how this protein is structured. Okay, so we know the structure, and we know the sequence of the protein. Okay, so here's the trick. Most of the time, that stuff is just revealed to the world, right? And it gets published in the paper, and everybody can download it. There's databases like the protein protein data bank where you can go and download those structures and sequences, but for this contest, there are a few structures that are solved by people, but then not published. They're withheld from public knowledge hmm. for the specific purpose of testing everybody else's ability oh, to predict so what the cool. structure is, right? Cool. Yeah. Okay. So they do this every two years, and they, you know, they collect the structures, and they have particular features, and then they're scoring where you can tell... You know, you can imagine if I if, if I showed you the structure, it would just be some trajectory of the of the chain in space, okay? Uh -huh. And so my prediction is just another trajectory in space, and you can score me for like how far off I am, right? Cool. Like what's the average distance of my trajectory from this from the actual thing? Mm -hmm. And there's also there's a little there's a few other details, but that that's basic. That's the main thing that you have to care about. Okay, so. Wait, have you entered these... any of the, these contests before? No, 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 no. No, but I'm, you know, I'm sort of adjacent to this field, and I, I, of course, I've worked a lot on protein misfolding and other other parts of these things. Um, and so early in my career, I had this kind of choice: should I go work on protein folding? And I'm like, eh, I don't really find it that interesting. Um, but of course, there's tons of people. It is a very interesting problem, uh -huh. and it's super challenging. Um, and there are tons of different approaches. Okay, so now there are all these teams, like literally teams, that cool. compete to predict these structures and they get scored on them and every year you figure out who's the top person who's not. So right. so so what this contest like you get there and then they give you the problems or or do they give you the problems yeah, there's and a, you submit there's answers? a I mean I actually don't know the, the specific details of how they they do this but yeah there's a there's a point at which they reveal and then you have there's a time at which you have to submit your predictions and cool. you don't you, you don't just submit one you submit you know your top 3 or whatever. I don't actually okay, again cool. don't know that. So you get to specific. work on your lab in your lab rather than like at a convention or something like that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not, and it's not so much live from the, the yeah. idea. Is, is that, right? that would be amazing. Just like a bunch and of people like with microscopes. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, so right. So, so two years ago, um, AlphaFold entered mm -hmm. and it actually did really well. Okay. So um, my recollection is that it was actually one of the top scoring teams, if not the top scoring team. And it was significantly like better, but not like, you know, not so it hadn't pulled far. You know, people were like, oh, that's really interesting. They've really done something. We'll see what they do um, in a couple of years. They probably won't be able to improve as much as they, as you know, as they just did. Mm -hmm. So this year they came and they just walloped people <laughs> okay. to, the, to the point where they're like, you know, the best folks in the, in the, in the field um, and for those who are, who are interested, you know, look up David Baker for protein structure prediction. Um, you know, he's invested his career not just on this problem. He does a bunch of other things and like really interesting stuff, right? So, but but on this particular problem, absolutely, you know, he was far and away the leading mind, and his team got got just cranked by 
by AlphaFold. And, and so, so, so these are problems that they already know the answers to uh, at the contest, and and this is what right. they extrapolate to thinking that yep. they basically can solve any protein. Or so that's why I, I want to say that the <laughs> you know the conclusion is the, the the correct conclusion is they won the contest and they won it by a lot, mm -hmm. and it's a super impressive achievement. Um, it does not mean that they've solved the protein folding problem. <laughs> okay. Right. So let's get not get ahead of ourselves, right? It's the um, it's similar to the um, to like know, our they... vaccine works in clinical trials. Um, have you cured the disease? You know, we, we have some work to do. So they have to, and, and it's actually not quite that because you know there this suspicion is it's the same problem everywhere around here. Every protein structure in principle is different. Okay. And you have many many different you know wild variations. So who knows if there's just like it, you know, in the in the case of uh, AlphaStar, for people who know that that results, you know, okay, fine, you can win against these three players. Doesn't necessarily mean that you can win against this fourth player who has a completely different style, a completely different grasp of the game, a completely different approach. Did they, you do enough did of those? They fail like, okay. at any of them, though. Like, like uh, in the contest, like did AlphaFold like fail at solving any of them, or were they not like close to or perfect at any of them? I don't actually know the the detailed results. Mm -hmm. um, just that, just that there's a big delta, and that they did extremely well. Okay, cool. Um, so you think it's a little bit overblown, kind of like what they did in yeah, StarCraft Two? Yes. Okay, yeah, because because they did the same thing in StarCraft Two, right? Like they didn't really beat Serral; they beat TLO in in a show match, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. but but you know, it's it's clear still that there's this, you know, if you if you if you want to get a, a beautiful view into this, like watch the the AlphaGo documentary, which mm -hmm. is just freely available on YouTube. It's amazing, right? Yeah. I mean, Lisa Dahl is an incredible nine down player and just got walloped. And you could see he was like reconsidering his relationship with the game, given that he just got beaten by this laptop. <laughs> that's the kind of feeling that's now happening in the protein structure uh, and prediction community. A bunch of people who have invested their lives in working on this problem are like, we can't compete. Mm. What in the world do we do now? I see. Wow. Yeah, that's kind of rough, huh? Yeah, right? Um, so you you know, you you embrace and extend, you figure out, you know, there's there's some aspect of the problem where you need insight. So this is my my advisor Francis Arnold, uh, the Nobel Prize winner from from 2018, she of course well aware of this she educated me about this problem. She first congratulated them heartily and then said, "Now do the protein function prediction problem." Which is? Right? Which is the okay, these the shape of these things is just a, you know it's a, it's a waypoint right like what you really want to know is okay can you predict what it does what the protein does in the cell can, and can you then you know if you grasp those rules from structure to function that means we can then take a function and build proteins de novo right like just from scratch mm -hmm. that will solve new enzymatic problems right new biological problems such as that's really what we want to do right and so they, you know there are there are stairs on this staircase. Can you educate go. us really quick on like what, like the importance of this, like uh, in terms of biology, yeah. like what what type of what types of uh, yeah, I guess medical advances are probably the most applicable. Yeah. So um, let's assume that it that it uh, let's assume that this generalizes, right? So I think we've said enough about the you know let's not get to be too hasty, but like imagine that the protein structure problem really were solved. Mm -hmm. Then we could take arbitrary sequences, and those we have been uh, pulling together for years, right? Like we have tons. Sequencing is something that human humanity can do, <laughs> and so we have tons of sequences lying around the place. Now we can almost immediately, right, if this problem is solved, convert that um, into information about um, what are the structures that, of those things in the cell, which gives us then the ability to say, okay. Um, we have, uh, I guess, sort of s approximate approaches where we can say, uh, if you can tell me what the structure is, then I can compare that structure to a bunch of other things that, that we already know the function of mm -hmm. and guess the function of those things. We can say things like, if I change the sequence, can I rearrange the protein structure to have particular features that I want? So for example, I want to change the enzymatic activity of this particular protein so that, you know, in one case, it takes in some, you know, 
small molecule that's present in your body and breaks it down. Now I want to be able to make it take in an antibiotic or a pro, what's called a pro drug, right? Something that is um, a drug that you can you can ingest, but it, that is not itself biologically active. Mm -hmm. The protein could then be tweaked a little bit to take that pro drug and and cleave it into two pieces. One of which is the active drug that gets activated in a, say a particular part of your body. That, that would be an amazing you know fun engineering task to be able to do. What we can't do right now is Sounds dangerous. Tell no, I mean <laughs> these sorts of things people are doing you know for drug delivery and things like this. You know it sounds dangerous unless you're dying. Right. At which point it sounds maybe great. Yeah, because you're right. Right. We can't do this. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we can't do right now is say, well, if I make these changes in the protein sequence, what's it going to do to the protein? We have no idea because we don't we haven't you know, particularly if those if those changes are major. They may seem like they're going to get us what we want, but we can't tell if it's going to fold up into the proper shape. Does this tie any in any way uh, with what we were discussing with directed evolution, then, for example? Absolutely. Yes. This means, you know, with directed evolution, we talked about the idea of having a screen. So you, you know, you mutate the protein and then you take those mutants and you test them against some biological activity. Right. And, and you do that in a, in a washing machine or in a simulated washing machine, uh, like a series of test tubes, for example, if we were to try to solve that problem. Um, and for those who are confused by that analogy, <laughs> what, <laughs> yeah. <first podcast. laughs> right? yeah. um, but here, you know, if, if we said, look, we know that that um, if these mutants have a particular shape, then they're going to be good candidates. They're, you know, they're not going to be horribly disrupted. Well, then we can focus all of our attention on the things that are promising candidates and save ourselves massive amounts of money and time and effort. Mm. In fact, if we're good enough, and if we know the link to protein function from for a particular protein fold, we can then just say, great, we can predict protein function just for this narrow thing. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to do any experiments, right, if the problem is truly solved. And that's, you, that's one of the ideas here. That is, is, that protein, that is the problem of protein. function, the function problem. That's right. No, well, okay. well, I mean, I'm, Which I'm we, saying we if, should the, be if far the protein away from folding that. problem is solved, then we can focus on this next stage narrowly. Cool. Um, and it's super expensive right now to solve the structure of a protein. Mm -hmm. Right? It takes, it's still, people get their PhD spending years finding exactly the right conditions to get the structure of a protein. So mm -hmm. it's very challenging to do. To be able to do it with a computer quickly, that's transformative. It's going <laughs> to you know, it's going to change the PhD trajectories of a bunch of people in my department. Oh, how are they feeling? I haven't surveyed them yet because I've been, uh, I don't know, there's this thing happening. So I've been cooped up at home. So I haven't seen a lot of them, <laughs> but it's a great question. You know, some of them personally, but they must be oh, yes, devastated yeah, no, to some degree, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, my, my department is mostly what we call structural biologists, right? So, oh. so people whose livelihood is about solving the structures. Yeah. So this is slightly different for them. You know, they're not trying to predict the structures. They're the ones who actually go out and figure out the ground truth, right? They, they use the actual experimental techniques to interrogate the protein and figure out what its actual structure is. Um, but believe me, if it works, their world is totally different. That's crazy. All right. Um, hey, I watched a, a documentary, not a documentary, actually. It was a, a talk that I wanted to touch base with you on also. Um, I, I know you, you watched part of my discussion with the neuroscientist guy, right? I did. I only watched the first, first few minutes. So yeah. Um, anyway, like I, I, I had a little bit of a disagreement with him because what I was proposing was that there is, um, brain like structures in nature, um, mm -hmm. in the sense that like there are networks of like, like mycelial networks and like, yeah. Plants. And he was saying the brain is so much different and so much cooler and stuff like that. But then I was watching this video and they were talking about basically just plants and, and, and these networks and how very incredibly similar they are to our, our brain structures. Sure, you were not watching Avatar? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Let's see. I'll link you the video. I, it, it was mind blowing. Um, yeah, there's a lot of these. I mean, uh, if you watch slime molds, right, which are these single-celled organisms yeah. that show this incredible collective behavior. Um, if you look at bacterial um, mats and microbial communities, they um, they are processing information 
right? And and sharing like electrical information and things like this at, at large scale. So you know, while the the precise details are of course different, right? The brain is mm -hmm. specifically like its 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 entire purpose is to do this versus a, a sort of a, a, a one of the things that a, that a microbial community can do, but it's it doesn't appear to be its primary function to do it. Right. Um, there are still, you know, I think it's fair to say that 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 analogy and the connections, right, the conceptual conceptual connections are there. And absolutely, you can frame these things in terms of information processing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. That there's something from the environment that's coming in, and there's some calculation that's being done that's adaptive for the organism in question that then gets executed, and and that kind of of, of information processing. Yeah. has its has its basis in these sorts of like large scale connected networks exactly. yeah it was called the, the video is called intelligence without brains which is basically that right it's it's yeah yeah it's intelligence and it's processing by um not just not just uh seemingly separate organisms but but uh but but collectives right and this happens in the animal kingdom as well as the plant and the mycelial kingdom i suppose if that's a kingdom mm -hmm. i'm not sure yeah it makes i mean i, I don't know that much about mm -hmm. the um the mycelial networks. Mm -hmm. uh, I just know that they're vast, right? Like the yeah. for those who don't know, you know mycelia are the, the things underneath the mushroom, right? The mushroom is this tiny little bit that we are, are familiar with, but really you get something that is like orders of magnitude larger that lives uh, under the ground. Yeah. And is connecting all of these little tendrils mm -hmm. in a very zerg like fashion. Yeah. And and what was mind blowing also is that while we like we we tend to recognize obviously animals and we tend to uh, think of animals as like uh, conscious and stuff like that, but but when it comes to plants, they move and they react and they act at such a different time scale than us scale, right. that that we kind of don't think of them as 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 living as much as we would animals. But but then if <laughs> if you look at like this time lapses that they show in this video, it's very apparent that there's like like insane like information processing and that they're acting yeah. and reacting to each other and sharing information and you know and they're obviously they're incredibly successful right they populate most of the planet and yeah. uh yeah i i just watched this video and i was so very happy because uh because yeah i, li I like plants they're cool <laughs> plants are cool right <laughs> no and this idea is like sensing or responding to your environment right single cells can do that and they can do it in really amazing ways mm -hmm. uh, it's there's a, it's a beautiful example of how like just e coli bacteria right the things that come from our our guts um if you drop them in a in a test tube that has a gradient of sugar, mm -hmm. they will they'll go find the sugar, and they do it with this like completely stupid algorithm, right? I don't know oh, if you right. know about this, but this is they they only have two things that they can do. Okay, they have uh, what are called flagella on them, so they you know if the, if the the bacterium is like this, they have these long corkscrew shaped hairs that come off of them like propellers. Okay. Mm -hmm. And these things can can either turn one direction or turn the opposite direction. When they turn one direction, all of them bundle up together into a sort of like torpedo propeller type of thing, and it moves the bug in one direction. Okay. If they turn the other direction, then they all go random, and the the bug just sort of like tumbles around. Okay. Okay. So these are called, these are two moves: run and tumble. <laughs> and that's all they can do. And so what they do is like if they and they have the ability to sense whether the concentration of of uh, of sugar is changing. And if so, if it goes up, then they they bias their motors to go more toward the run direction. And if they if it's getting worse, they they reverse the motors and they go into the tumble. Okay. And so then they do these like crazy random walks, but those random walks are not random, right? They're right, biased right. random walks that take them closer and closer and closer to the high concentrations of sugar. So it's it's amazing, right? It's the stupidest possible thing. Right? It's so simple, right? Like you have these exactly these two moves, and yet they find the sugar, right? And then make more E. coli, <laughs> they do more of this. <laughs> this information processing, right? And how, you know, even individual cells can do this. It's super, super fun. Yeah, and it's crazy. Like, I think I think there was a, a Nobel Prize one for reorganizing a subway system in, in Japan or in New York um, based on, on some of these organisms just basically finding food and they placed food where the, where the like, the train stations would be, I guess, where the, where the subway uh -huh. stations would be. And then they released... Uh, and yeah, then they would, you know, it would find yeah. it and they would, it would be very effective at it. For sure. There's two, like, uh, I'm just watching the, in the, in the chat, there's two, two questions. Um, uh, most recent one is from M06U3. Moog. Um, saying, most, yeah. 
uh, stochastic movement, yes, is exactly this. It's a stochastic algorithm for, for chasing a gradient of, of any chemical. This is called chemotaxis, is the general problem. And, uh, and this, is, this run and tumble thing is the way the E. coli and many other bacteria do it. Super cool, right? So statistically, you get the right answer, even though you don't go straight. Um, and there's a, this other question um, of, yes, it is cool. Uh, the, uh, what happens when, oh, there's, it's a question back to the protein let's structure go, thing. So maybe we can it, just yeah. touch on this quickly. Mm -hmm. um, what happens if you take a protein structure and you, you like cut it in half? Do the two halves then know how to fold themselves? And in general, no, it's a disaster. Um, for, for starters, the, the protein is one continuous chain. And so if you cut a protein in half, then um, it doesn't really know, you know, then, it, then you're, it's in multiple pieces. But even does if you the took first, the chain- Does the first half know more than the it, second half? Is there, is there an order to it? There, there appears to be actually, it's, <laughs> which is, I mean, this is a very deep question. But it's because the way the proteins are made, they are, uh, there are these factories, these ribosomes that we talked about um, in, in cells where the, the genetic information is being read out and it's uh, the growing chain of amino acids kind of comes out of what's called, technically speaking, an exit tunnel <laughs> at the back end of this thing. So it looks like it's just being squeezed out of a toothpaste tube or something. Uh -huh. Okay, so the chain comes out. And what that means is the first part of the chain comes out first and the second part of the chain always comes out second. Okay, and so this first part, while the second part is still inside or not even translated yet, that first part can start to fold. Oh, cool! And its folding may actually influence the later stuff that comes out. Okay, so they there is all this this work on vectorial protein folding. If for those who are interested, um, where yeah, that certain parts of the chain can fold independently, um, and you can have these sort of even uh, the domains that protein fold up into can be like beads on a string. Cool. Together. But so, yeah, and generally, you can't split the thing in half. Um, it's going to be uh, a real mess unless it's one of these things where the two domains themselves that the proteins are folding into. I'm using the word domain. It just means kind of a, a smaller protein fold that is independent. If those things are on the same chain and you split them in the, in the middle, both of those will typically fold on their own. They don't need each other to, to do it. So they'll, they'll continue to fold properly. Cool. So the answer is no, but there's some some ifs and buts. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, back to the plants, because this is so cool. Uh, plants about which I know nothing. <laughs> That's okay. Like, what I found so amazing is it seems to be it seems to be like they're like they're actively like discovering like how this um, and understanding how the how this happens and how these networks operate and like the magnitude at which they operate and how how similar they are to mm. our brains and how they are information processing systems essentially even though they're not like you know that they don't seem like individuals but rather they do so collectively and and there was an expert also for example on ants and and he was talking about um leaf cutter ants and just how how very intricate those guys are and like how they all have different tasks and they're like super duper um like specialized yeah. They and they even like domesticate. Um, uh, what is it that they they domesticate? Mm -hmm. They grow fungus. That's that's yeah. why they 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 cut leaves, right? Yeah. So they bring it, bring it back and put it underground, and the fungus grows on the leaves. And uh -huh. so they're they're farmers. Yeah, they're, they're farmers, and and yeah, and they all have like their different tasks, and and it really brought forth ideas of intelligence outside of of structures like the brain, right? Like enclosed systems, yeah. I suppose. Um, and what I found was every scientist there was very warm to that idea, like all five of them, and they were very high-grade scientists, but none of them was willing to admit that they were warm to the idea of like, like say, because, because the, the questions were like, what do you think about, like, about this? What, could that be, is that intelligence, right? And they would no, be right. like, well, it's by definition, then, it is yeah. intelligence. Like, by definition, it is intelligence. But, you know, by, but if you say that that it is, it some people get upset. It, and, it depends you know, and you on what the definition published. is. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. If, you know, if you mean information processing, then yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what, what, what we mean by intelligence can vary based on you mm -hmm. know, a bunch of different uh, contexts. As soon as you, you know, you, you know me, I, I, I dislike the semantic stuff, mm -hmm. right? Because it... it it ends up being like this, I want to agree with you. And I, so let me try to tease out the part that I do agree with. It's like kind of disconnected from your words. But yeah, information processing by these large network systems, that's fine. Everybody sort of agrees that that, that happens. Is it intelligent? Well, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. 
and it's not going to be signaling us anytime soon. You know, it's oh. like unclear that um, it possesses the sorts of capabilities that we typically associate with the with intelligence in our species, right? Exactly. This idea of open ended creativity, the ability to create technology, you know, those those sorts of things. But of course, we're animals, mm -hmm. right? So we're on a continuum. And it's not so clear that the continuum can only contain uh, animals, right? Of course, there's going to be degrees of behavior that are shared by or all plants, life. Or plants, for that matter, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a fun time to like now try to figure out, okay, what are these things doing? How are they processing uh, that information? And to what extent should we mm -hmm. then knock ourselves down a peg because of the sophistication yeah. of these systems. Yeah, and that's something that they all that they all talked about. It's like, yeah, we we you know, it's it's a it's a tendency of ours to anthropomorphize everything and to make yeah. it seem like it's all about us and really it's just the brain is just one system and there's so many other systems out there that seem to do the same thing to similar degrees of efficiency of efficacy. And yeah. um and so many different brains. There's a there's a beautiful uh, book called Kinds of Minds. Mm -hmm. That just looks at you know the different ways in which even brains are structured, and so the you know, fun example of um, you know, the octopus, which we agree, you know, everybody agrees, is is intelligent in a kind of not ignorable, not mm. really debatable way. Right? Yeah. They can do problem solving. They can do all sorts of really, like really interesting things. Oh, have you watched the documentary never... by the way? There's a documentary on Netflix called My Octopus Teacher. It is wonderful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you should watch. But it. so their um, their arms have independent quasi independent um, nervous systems mm -hmm. right and so they they have this you know, the the octopus itself is kind of a consortium at some level of many of, brains yeah exactly <laughs> and yeah you know so then you can ask this question of like what is their experience life mm. like or where where is the octopus really <laughs> right like yeah. what does that even mean right it causes you to challenge your kind of assumptions about the the this central experience that we have mm. Right, that really is back to our previous conversation, illusory to some degree. Right, mm -hmm. like where is it all happening? Yeah. Okay, you know, clearly the brain is up here. There's no yeah. question about that. Mm -hmm. um, but it it has this sense of being someplace, and that sense of being is itself a neural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Right, it's not an accurate reflection of somehow of the of the the feeling of what a brain computing is like. Yeah, and the ant guy talk, touched on this a little bit because he was like like this is our brain and that's what it does but imagine like all of the ants together are like a brain like all of them together operate like 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 a single brain right so imagine yeah, imagine doing that and how yeah so like you know and in an ant system like is there such a right. thing as a be sure. maybe there's not being an ant but there's being there's, there's something like what it is to be an ant colony or something like that you know like an, uh, yeah presumably right who knows and you know i think there's there's a degree to which we um assume that you know it, it very much feels like this is my hand right mm -hmm. and i know it's my hand and i it, i know what it feels like for it to be my hand and there's these great um uh not not experiments but like occasional chance things uh, one of these was mm. uh, was described uh, by oliver Sacks, who's now no longer with us but but uh, an uh, unbelievable writer about kind of neural phenomena um and strange kind of neural features that certain people have due to accidents or due to, you know, birth and so on. Phantom limbs and uh, stuff. Uh, there's a book that he wrote called A Leg to Stand On. Um, and that's where he got, he got a nerve injury. Okay. And, <laughs> and to set this up, he describes a, a, um, a sailor on a ship mm -hmm. who suffers this horrible accident and gets this, this deep ner nerve injury in his leg. And he's asleep, you know, after, you know, the, the kind of acute care um, beginning of his recovery, he's asleep. He wakes up in his bed and he realizes that his shipmates have played this terrible trick on him. They have put a disembodied severed leg in his bed with him. And so he freaks out and like grabs this thing and throws it out of bed and of course falls out of bed because it's his own leg, right? He's lost. He's got a nerve injury, right? So he's lost the sense that it is his which is called proprioception, right? This like the sense of where your limb is and the sense that it is yours can be lost, yet your limb is still attached to you. That's like fact, the opposite of phantom limb then, kind of. It's the opposite of a phantom limb, that's, that's right. That's cool, yeah. It's, it's sort of, right, exactly. The phantom limb, right, is the, is the sense of the limb without the limb itself, and this mm -hmm. is the limb itself without the sense of it, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, but 
the description of this is that it is startling to, to realize that this illusion can be broken. Despite the fact that, you know, some people actually have this um, without having an injury. They just, you know, this is the way that it is. They um, describe having to say reach for the telephone, but they have to follow their hand with their eyes the whole way because they have no sense in space of where their hand is. Oh, wow. Right. It simply is, is absent. So this illusion is very powerful, but it's just an illusion, right? It's a, it's a neural feature. It's not a feature of like of of us, right? It's a it's a special thing that's created, and we at some level are just an assembly of these kinds of illusions that allow us to engage in this this you know crazy detailed behavior. Interesting. Similarly, you can imagine that's kind of what it's like to be an ant colony, right? Right. So we are in a certain sense an ant colony of our own limbs sure. and of our own right. We're a loose consortium of these kinds of you know. Of control That's systems incredible. Yeah. welded together with with a kind of you know goal oriented self illusion, right? Yeah, and neurons are just like they're they're cells, accurate, right? Is that is that right? Um, neural and, cells? Yeah, they're neurons. Like the, yeah, 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 they're just they're, they're just cells. And and really and really the processing is um, the information that they're that they're passing on to each other rather than in the neuron itself, right? Like. Or how do yeah, you know much? I mean, it, it's a little tricky because mm -hmm. the, of course, there's a there's a relationship between the structure of a neuron, mm. um, its connections to other neurons, and, and thus the way that it can pass information. Okay. Right. So you can think of most neurons as as having this, um, what we call integrate and fire kind of thing. So the 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 thing that the, the neuron does is execute um, a spike. Okay, so an act, what we call an action potential. Mm -hmm. So you can think of it as just kind of uh, sparking or zapping. Okay. okay, and when does it do that? Um, it does that when it when it is listening to a bunch of other neurons, and it's sort of collecting their signals, and it has um, uh, inhibitory or activating kind of potentials attached to it, and it's, it does essentially a math bit where it says, okay, if most of my of most of the things that I'm talking to or I'm listening to, excuse me are saying you should probably zap mm -hmm. it's like okay i'm gonna zap and, and if less than half of them are then it's like okay i'm gonna, just gonna stay silent right now okay so you get signals you pr propagate through these networks when it zaps it then is talking to a bunch of downstream neurons right in, the, in its network does it and they generate are also the electricity kind of then does it generate mm -hmm. its own electricity to zap or or is the electricity yes. just going yes. around oh okay yep yeah these are i mean it's electricity but it is just charged ions right so you know probably you know salt like table salt sodium chloride is is positively charged sodium and negatively charged chloride and so the movement of these ions from one side of the cell to another to from outside the cell to inside the cell constitutes a uh, electric current okay and so it's that's the electricity that's using is basically these ion channels are opening up and you're causing potassium or or calcium or uh, or sodium to move through these channels and then change the electric potential of the cell, which then generates one of these waves of electrical activity, a uh, very sharp spike of electro electrical activity that can then be passed down long nerve um, nerve fibers to zap things that are at the end of those fibers, which are typically other neurons or things like your muscles, right? Which are listening to the neuron saying, should I contract now? Okay, fine, I got my zap. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, and yeah, in this video, they were talking about how like there's like all throughout nature, there is transferring and, and there is communicating with this calcium and potassium and, and, mm -hmm. and whatever else of like this different, um, I guess, cells, uh, neuron like cells. Right. And and how we yeah. were kind of like locked into thinking about uh, the the brain as such a as such a cool thing because we called it neural um neural networks instead of just networks because there's many networks that do the same thing but we think the neural network is super special for for some reason yeah i mean i guess i would say the people who actually work on these things um you know when we say neural network we typically mean a uh, a simulated network that was designed based on taking inspiration from neurons right and they really do do this kind of thing where it takes information mm -hmm. and then it it does some math, applies what we call a nonlinearity to that. It decides whether or not you're over some threshold. If you're over a threshold, then pass the signal down to the next layer of neurons, right? So it's really structured like a brain and has these, you know, if you hear neural network, um, they're very, very heavily neurally inspired. Yeah. And it is not at all clear that that kind of same thing 
is happening in, um, in say, large groups of plants, right? Or mycelium, right? The, that, that fungi make mm-hmm. under the ground. You know, there's a, there's a question as to whether or not that's happening. It's totally clear, however, that there are gradients of chemicals being secreted, right? And that, that there are large scale patterns of communication and connection. Mm-hmm. It's just not clear that they're working in that specific neuron way of like, take all my signals, make some comp- computation, fire, pass it on to the next, right? Right. Because then, then we would have to be talking about consciousness in some of these networks potentially, or like some emergent phenomena from this communication, right? Like <laughs> Certainly emergent phenomena, yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, then it gets down to like, to, to what extent do we, you know, there's a, there are a bunch of different meanings of consciousness, right? It was to, great. It was great because in this video, at the very end, um, the interviewer like asks these five scientists who again seemed very warm to this idea, right? Like, yeah. and 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 they, and she asks, so what about consciousness? And they all go, oh, the c word, <laughs> the c word. <laughs> and they're like, ah, I want to get published, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right. No, so, it's 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 fun to speculate about. That's what yeah. I you know I I really enjoyed our our last conversation where we we both got to kind of you know sit in our in our plush armchairs mm-hmm. and speculate because <laughs> yeah. it's that's fun to do. If you're a practicing scientist, you want to make sure there's a little bit of an air gap between <laughs> that yeah. speculation and your professional right, yeah. positions. Yeah. yeah, but but do you think that that's a bad thing? Do you think that it's that because because it's so taboo in current science, and it seems and it seems like we should be warming up to ideas of these emergent phenomena as, as being a I, little bit more significant than you know. Yeah, I, so I agree with you, and um, and I don't think that people are really that. Um, uh, that unwilling to do it. There's plenty of folks out there who are thinking about these emergent phenomena are thinking about, you know, what is a what is a reasonable definition that we can apply even in a limited way to to define consciousness and then ask whether other biological systems might have that, you know, how do we how do we get it? there's a whole range of, of of curiosity where you tend to find, you know, and I think this is it, it helps to have this um, is that the people doing, you know, oftentimes doing the deep experimental work are um, not super wedded to any particular ideas about what they're supposed to be finding. Yeah. That I think is important it's as good. a kind of yeah. professional perspective. And you want to be, you know, you don't want people's belief in your experiments to be influenced by what they think you think that you want to find. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Now, we can all then, you know, agree under certain circumstances to go. Okay, well, tell me what you really think. You're like, are there any cameras, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, they have an opinion, right? But, right, right. But as a professional matter, I think it's that a, makes it's sense. Easy. That makes a lot of sense. Like from a from a strictly scientific perspective, I think we're trying. I guess we're trying to make as specific statements as we can and as unbiased as as we can. And yeah, yeah as as rigorous, as reliable, mm-hmm. as reproducible. Absolutely, right. Yeah, that makes perfect. And it's a you know, it's an ongoing struggle. Uh, even for me as a practicing scientist, to not fall in love with my own ideas, mm-hmm. to uh, not not have any biases, but just be honest about what they are, and to train my group, for example, to to uh, celebrate, for example, data that has been collected properly mm-hmm. for itself, completely independent of whether or not it confirms or denies some pet hypothesis that we have. Yeah. Right. And that, you know, that's a cultural thing. It's like you have to work very hard uh, to, to create that kind of proper feeling that I, I think allow, you know, it's just essential to do good science, right? Mm-hmm. That kind of deep layer of, uh, level of honesty and respect for gathered reality, <laughs> yeah, independent of the, your interpretation of it. Yeah, I, I, suppose, I suppose the issue that I take with it, if, if any, because what you say makes perfect sense, right? Like, I think that's that's a good thing and, and a good way to approach science. But um, but there's a lot of people who are too reductionist and, and too, I feel like, um, closed off to these yeah. ideas or that will look down on on philosophy and, and what and what these ideas might entail, right? Like what, what this information might actually translate into. And from my perspective, the problem is that I don't know how we ever would confirm that, say, a network of of, of mushrooms could have a, an experience of what it is like to be alive. And I, and I don't mean yeah. like subconscious experience. I mean like a conscious experience, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, first, I agree with you, of course. Um, and 
I, I've, you know, I'm, my science is characterized by, it's very ideas forward. We do experiments, but I'm interested in the concepts. I'm interested in changing how people think, not changing what they know. And yeah, I think that distinction is, is important. Still, mm. uh, if you look at what, say, Christoph Koch has, has been working on in, in identifying the neural correlates of consciousness, that is, identifying the activity in the brain that, that, that correlates most closely with conscious experience. Mm -hmm. you know, it's clear that there are things in the back of our head in what's called V1, the visual area, that are primarily um, taking signals from the retina and kind of decomposing them into features that are then passed on to higher levels of, of visual cortex. Right? And so they, we know what their job is, and it doesn't appear to have much of anything to do with consciousness. Okay. Okay. And there are places where you know, like, oh, this is where you feel scared, and this is the, <laughs> there. Are, there are a bunch of sort of specialized areas, the motor cortex up top, that are not obviously conscious. At the same time, everybody agrees that consciousness. Well, okay, most people agree that consciousness is a is a physical phenomenon happening in the brain, and so there must be neurons, right, or networks of neurons that are carrying out that uh, that activity. So, what are they, and how do you search for them? And it's it's quite clear that you know we have a we have relatively reliable uh, ways to assess people's conscious experience. You could, we know how to show things to people so that they have no conscious experience of them. So as we discussed, you know, showing them th things very quickly, mm -hmm. where they still get the information, but they're sort of not aware of it. This whole idea of subliminal advertising, which is overblown, but still it gives you the right the right feeling that you can convey information that's that's below the level of of, of conscious perception. Yeah. Um, like the Disney movies when they had the sex in the in the clouds that Simba was looking at. <laughs> you ever I, seen it? Never, I never saw that. Is that true? Uh, yeah, but I, but they said it was by mistake. It was, they said it was no, by just mistake. by mistake. Yeah, yeah. accident. Uh -huh. uh, so yeah, so we can we can um, we can query people and we can expose them to stimuli where, like that are that are that are conscious, and we can also take recordings from neurons in the brain. So. We should be able to put these pieces together. It's a very detailed question as to how you evaluate whether or not, you know, to what extent some neuron is involved in conscious processing versus some obviously non-conscious uh, process. But you can imagine if you could solve that problem, then you could go do that same procedure or things like it to mushrooms, mm -hmm. right? To the mycelia. I see. And so I think there is a, a, a sense in which if, once you figure out how to rigorously ask these questions to the, to the extent that they have a, a, a rigorous answer, yeah. those you know, hopefully are generalizable principles that we could point at any biological system. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, uh, like, yeah, parting from the, from the perspective, I suppose that consciousness is a physical phenomena, right? Uh, or an, an, an emergent from the physical realm in, in, in sure. any case. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm personally not completely sold on that. Like, I think it's kind of like a give and take, like, um, uh, and, and again, like, I think that in quantum physics, it appears as though as if the observer effect suggests that, you know, like maybe there's something, um, if not beneath, at least that is required in tandem with to materialize the physical realm. Um, so from my perspective, uh, from my perspective, I think that, that there is something like a conscious realm and, and a physical realm and they're interrelated and they give rise to each other. Uh, in, in any case, I do believe that in the physical realm, you could find all the correlates for the conscious realm. Um, so, and vice versa. I mean, we are looking at the physical realm from the conscious realm in, in, in a, in a certain other sense, even though like like you like you said last time and i completely agree there's a lot more processing that's going on outside of our conscious experience of course and consciousness is not in that right. sense uh it's, you're right. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, necessarily yeah. um as primal as as we would like to believe which doesn't doesn't say that they're not not for, yeah not not for not not for maybe information gathering or processing or for or for things to work in the way that they do in the physical realm but but yeah here's here's where my where my take would be, if there is no consciousness, th then there may as well not be a physical realm because there's yeah, nothing I, to, yeah. Of course, you know, I, I get this. Of course, I, I, I have a slightly different perspective, um, which I, I just say, you know, there, there's an equation of, of consciousness with experience mm -hmm. 
that I think goes too far, right? That if you if you appreciate yeah. that experiences can be had that are not conscious, and experience is in, is, is in some way primary, mm-hmm. right? In other words, if no one were there to if no thing were there to experience it, would it matter? You know, there I can get I can get a little mm-hmm. bit more on board, but but experience is not consciousness necessarily, right? And uh, consciousness is a, is one of the tools that we use to process experience, um, but it is not experience itself. And I, I know that these I that see. is a that's not an idea that lands for everybody. And people have argued the opposite, of course. You know that it is the one thing that matters. I suppose um, I know consciousness from the moment I wake up. So, but but you're suggesting that there would be another way to intake, or that that there are other ways to intake information and process it that aren't for sure. necessarily I mean, conscious. And, on on occasion, we experience this very delightful. Um, uh, you know, really deep flow mm-hmm. that is characterized by some, you know, first of all, doing our best, most sort of detailed work and also suddenly, you know, awakening from a reverie and going, what was I doing for the past hour? Yeah. As if, you know, it, it truly as if we were like unconscious at some yeah. very fundamental level of what we're doing. Right. And this That's is the flow states, right? The idea, right. That you can, you can sort of live back, you know, you goes away and this, <laughs> this stuff is allowed to kind of come out and say, ah, <laughs> all right, let's let's go to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I suppose if there's no conscious record of that work, then what is like what is the work anyway? It's no right, and that's con- connected to memory, right? And the whole mm-hmm. idea of, of of an experience that leaves a mark. Mm-hmm. Sure. And and I do think you know you can, if I, uh, you know, if I sneak in, um, and. Uh, well, no. If a mosquito sneaks in and gives you a mosquito bite while you're asleep, you may have no conscious experience of it. But there's a record, and it may affect your life, right later on. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's not that you have to be aware of everything that that happens in the moment. Yeah. On, on that ground, I completely agree, and I completely agree that consciousness, in from that perspective specifically, is overblown. It's over. I was talking to a StarCraft pro, one of the younger ones. They sometimes reach out to me for like advice or for like. Help. I wonder why. <laughs> And uh, and he was telling me he's a, he's extremely stressed, and, and we were talking about a routine and how he he might uh, want to instill some better routines in his life, and and maybe start the day by meditating or exercising. And he was telling me all the things that he's worried about actively, right? And and that he and that he feels like he would like to change. And he was very very intent on the idea of doing it, of doing it consciously. And I and I said, well, I think if you just consciously instill or or consciously like aid yourself to get the routine down for the for for at first right and and maybe if we uh do this and report back to me and i'll report back to you that, that you're meditating every day or that you're um exercising every day and I, and I gave him a few choices of things that would be good to add to his routine um and the, and then i said it's not so important right like like the conscious processing and the conscious idea that you're in control of everything and that you should be um, actively trying to make everything work in your favor, because if you just get the routine going, then your body's going to do the work for you. You're just going to, you're just going to kind of d- do the thing where you wake up from it and, and you're already doing it without knowing. And, and you're, without, and you're just, without, without thinking about it. Right. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is sports in a nutshell mm-hmm. is you, you know, you think about things during practice so that you don't have to think about it during the game, right? Like you, mm-hmm. the whole idea is to, to lay down these pathways so in such a routine and such a kind of instinctive way that you simply don't have to think about it. If you have, you know, if you do have to think about it, you will fail. You don't have time yeah, exactly. to do it. Yeah. And, and so he insisted and he said, ah, oh, but I like doing things, uh, uh, consciously. And I said, well, well, look at you <laughs> because, course. because, because you were, you are now breathing manually. And a second ago, you didn't know that you were breathing. So. And he was like, "Oh right. shit!" <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> and and that's what it. And yeah, and after that, he he was sold on it, and now yeah, now we're med- meditating. That's great. Day, yeah. So uh, so yeah, I'm I'm completely with you on that front. I think that routine and and just um, subconscious processing needs to be given a little a little bit more credit than we sometimes do. Yeah, and thinking deeply about these things. So that's, I just want to say I, I appreciate the way that you. Uh, you know, you grapple with these things as matters of real importance. Oh, thank you. Not just because they're, you know, intellectually interesting, but but because they can change the way that you live as well and change the way that you perceive your own life and success and failure and mm-hmm. uh, uh, 
I think I'm that's... trying to be a little bit more practical too. So like, uh, yeah, I think traditionally I'm a little bit more of a, like, I like, I like to think a lot, but as of late, I'm trying to be a little bit more practical. Um, I kind of, uh, stopped smoking weed, uh, for a couple of weeks now. So, uh, I'm going to go back to it though. <laughs> so don't, <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't give me too many okays, but, uh, <laughs> but I want, I want to regulate it cause I was smoking too much and I really want to just, you know, yeah, that's I, right. I want to get rid of it and then make a routine that works for me. And that's not hindering my ability to be productive and to do other things. You know? That is the thing when it get when it starts getting in the way, when anything starts getting in the way of what you actually want to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Then you're like, okay, how do I, you know, get free of this? Because we all have exactly, these. Yeah. yeah. We all have these. Yeah. Too much of anything is not good. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Alan, I really hope that we will uh, talk more often. Um, maybe the next time uh, something cool happens in science, or, or that you have anything to share. I really love talking to you. So it's give me a ping. Uh, it is a pleasure. This was a particularly, you know, particularly good one. But uh, great to see you. Great to chat. All right. Take care, and thank you very much again.